from Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, this is a Headache Soul production. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Morgan. With me today is my handsome and talented co-host, Joshua, the body finder, Bevan. The body finder. Oh, no. So Joshua and I have a shared experience. <laughs> shared experience. I except that neither of us found bodies. <laughs> he came closer than I did. Well, I found a body, but it was alive. <laughs> Uh, he, he came closer than I did, so let's talk about that. Okay, okay Joshua, you um, go first. I was at a local bar with some friends, and I, at, as we were finishing, I walked out into the parking lot. We, we were talking next to our cars, hanging out. I was two cars away from a, from a uh, white uh, Jeep Wrangler. I, and the parking what made you notice it? Because the parking lot clears out, and you kind of start to notice, okay, who's left? Okay. You know, and... Then the next day, I saw an alert from the local sheriffs that that white chief wrangler had a body in it that had likely been in there for three days, Mm -hmm. the report said. They also said a couple of things that it's hard to hard to know what to believe. They said at first it was a a 51 year old female and then it was a 55 year old male. And I'm like, "Mm, could someone, you know, be mistaken like a woman with a mustache or a dude with you know, a perm. I don't know. Um, I think it's a male. That was the last word. Plus they said, and it is the saddest thing because this happened, I guess, twice in the last couple of weeks here. Uh, no sign of foul play and no suicide. So someone who probably OD'd or had a medical issue. Those are about the only two things left. So the person, a male in an SUV in the Westfield shopping center three Saturdays ago, OD'd. And then this male or female, where I'm going to go with male, and the Jeep Wrangler may have OD'd or may have had a med- medical issue. Or, oh, God. Right. So Joshua sends me a text telling me about this after the story comes out. And he's like, I was right there. And I'm like, okay. And then he also added like a, another story about a woman coming out. And I'm like, now I don't oh, know what right. the fuck you're talking about. But <laughs> yeah, do those two things? Connect? No, they didn't line up. I was just telling you. You're about just the, sharing the, the drunken debauchery uh-huh. that was that we were the also drama. witnessing. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. yeah. So then, like the next day, I am walking Siren Marie Bitchface Morgan Humphreys early in the morning because I don't want it to get hot and burn her little paws. And my neighbor is staying. I I went. You know, like how a series of things happen to make you go or do something than, different than you normally do. I typically walk one way with her in the morning and a different way at night so she doesn't like get bored. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was going our normal morning way and a, a guy who has a very sweet but very nervous anxiety ridden um, lab. Okay. We stopped and said hi and you know they the dogs kind of talk and then I saw which way he was going. So I was like, I'll just go this way, sure. you know? Sorry. So I just don't, just to save us both from, right. you know? So I went the opposite way and I get to a little cul-de-sac and one of my neighbors is standing out there and is like, I, I guess maybe you'd call him basketball shorts, like kind of big short. He didn't have a shirt on. He's, I mean, he's, you know, handsome older guy. I don't know. I don't know why dudes. Anyway, he's standing. It's like five till seven. You're he's, welcome that I wore a shirt today. Oh, uh, thank yeah. you. And I love that one too. It has a rooster on it. Uh-huh. It's very cute. You look good in brown. Thank you. Do you typically show up here without a shirt? Uh, well, you... And I have not paid attention. <laughs> I think I would notice nipples. <laughs> yeah. I you, really, this is the first time you've worn a shirt. I, you were, you, wow! I gotta start listen, paying attention. I thought I, I was good with attention to details. <laughs> Apparently, I have been mistaken. Right. One year later, Joshua decides to wear clothing on the hottest day of the Almost. year. But hey, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I am not going to judge your decisions. Sure. Yeah. So this gentleman, barefoot, basketball shorts, no shirt, is standing on his driveway, and I walk past, and I don't think about it because. There's a lot of reasons a car could be running. Maybe they're going into a house to get something. Maybe they're waiting to pick up a kid for school. Sure. I don't know. I don't, who cares? But it's a big Dodge Ram diesel. So it's, la- it's loud. Oh, okay. You know, diesel. I didn't it's like, yeah, and it's right, running. Right, right, yeah. Who cares, right? So I'm walking my dog, and my neighbor goes uh, three, four houses down. He goes, is that truck still running? And I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah, it's been here a while. And I go, what's a while? And he goes, well, my bedroom's in the front of the house. My window was open. He pulled in at 3.05. Oh, jeez. And I'm like, it's been running for four hours? And he goes, yeah. And I go, is anyone in it? And he goes, I don't know. I didn't go look. I'm like, 
So a truck is running for four hours. Maybe he has an uncle who works at Exxon or right. he has a bunch yeah. of, like, how much money would that That's, be? Yeah, wow. I would think that'd be mm-hmm. expensive. I, yeah. So I, I walk Siren past it and it's, you know, it's a big truck and he's kind of a small dude and he's in the driver's seat, but I'm nosy Nelly. So I get a little closer. He is totally slumped over like toward the passenger seat. And there's a bottle of water, half, half used bottle of water in the console. There's no drug paraphernalia and his hands are kind of crossed in front of him. And I'm, you know, looking closely and some people sleep deeply, Sure, you know, um, not everybody like snores or, you know, I was waiting for like, you know, some sort of right. movement. Like right. if I couldn't see his chest, maybe his like lips or something. Uh, there wasn't, I didn't see any movement. Mm. And I was like, is that his chest? Did I make that up? So I wait around a few more minutes and another neighbor comes out of her house and goes, uh, is he still in there? And I go, yeah, I can't tell if he's asleep or, and she goes, yeah, he's been there a while. Like she was afraid to come out and walk her dogs. I don't know why. Hmm. So I call at five after seven. I call our local Santa Clarita Valley Sheriff's Department. The dispatcher was great. Um, She goes, oh, we've had one call. Is Is it the Dodge Ram? And I go, it is. And she said, we've already had one call. Sheriff's on his way. And I'm like, great. That's 705. Okay. 735. Mm -hmm. We, and you know how far we are from the new headquarters. Oh, that's right. Five to seven minutes. That's right. In traffic, right? Yeah. It's right here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was thinking. No, I'm, sir. I'm, I'm thinking over by. You City gave Hall. them extra, yeah. even. Yeah. No, no. It's Five right to here. seven minutes, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so a man who is very tiny and very young shows up driving an SUV. He can barely see over the steering wheel. And I'm about a half a block away. And I waited there. And Siren was so good. She would like stand and then she would lay down. And then she would sit. She wasn't pulling or anything. She it's waited the entire time. She was oh. so good. Because I wanted to make sure someone sure. fucking showed. And the more time that went by, I got a little more like, I thought about calling again. Yeah. And about the time I was going to call again, he pulls in. So I'm about a half a block away. And I point. I was like, like, there it is. Oh, okay. It's on the corner. So it's not hard to find. It's a big black diesel running sure. truck. So I turn around to start to walk home because he's here. I don't. That's it. Yeah. You're, and you he did your good deed. does done. a U-turn, comes around and parks right next to me on the sidewalk, rolls down the passenger side window and leans over. And he's like, ma'am, ma'am, I can't make him move. And I go, <laughs> I'm stunned. I go, what? Huh? Yeah. He goes, I can't make him move. It's not illegal to park your car on a street and leave it running. And I go, Oh my god. I don't I don't care. If he moves, I wanted to make sure he's alive. Right. And he goes, Okay, okay, look, ma'am, ma'am, people get oh. mad at me. <laughs> he kept fighting me. Oh. People get mad at me when I can't make people oh. move from their street. And I go, I oh. finally he kept interrupting me. And I finally I went, Sir, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Cause- we don't have assigned oh, parking. Back. It's a public street. There's no VIP parking. He can park wherever he wants. Right. I didn't ask for a tow truck. I asked for a welfare check. Right. I just want to make sure he's okay. Right. And he's like, okay, okay, but I can't make a move. And I was like, I can't even anymore. So I turn to you know, like walk away. I'm like, I'm stunned because right. I've never had a, a conversation with a, an adult male, let alone an adult male in law enforcement oh, man. who yeah. showed up on the defense. Yeah. You know, I know my neighbor who they called said, de-escalate. right, right. Like <laughs> my neighbor, who, my Susie, my neighbor who called said, there's a guy who's been sitting here for hours with his truck running and we want to make sure he's okay. I know what I said. And I didn't say, excuse me, dispatcher, <laughs> please have this truck removed from my presence. I am a very important person. Sure, right. I was like, is he dead? Right. I said to her, look, I'm looking in this window. I don't know if his chest is moving. I don't see right. it. Right. We've had two people OD in two weeks, and she goes, you don't have to explain. I understand. Thank you for calling. Yeah, I mean. (laughs) (laughs) And he's fighting me about if he can get the guy to move. And the poor guy, I felt so bad. So tiny, tiny, short Opie bangs. (laughs) He's a little man. Bangs on the window, scares the shit out of the guy. He shoots up. Sure. And and he's 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 deep in his nap. Totally. Oh, but I forgot to tell you, before that, uh, Opie goes, Look, 
Sorry. <laughs> He's a combination of Opie and Barney Fife. I love it. <laughs> he was young, but he like was sh- the shakiest gun in the West kind of thing. He was, it was the wor- weirdest thing. He says to me, uh, you know, that truck is registered d- to a different part of Rainbow Glen. And I'm like, I don't, do I look like I work at the DMV? What the fuck do I, I'm not writing him a ticket. What the fuck, dude? And then he goes, I mean, maybe he got thrown out of his house. And I go, yeah, maybe he's sleeping off a drunk. And then if he is, you know, good job, buddy, not driving when you're drunk. I don't care. What is going on? Could you see if he's alive, you dumb fucker? I mean, I was losing my, I I literally was like, this is, are you punking me? Do you see why I'm worried about gaslighting? Yeah. Yeah. His name was Joshua too. Deputy Dewey? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Deputy Opie. Opie? <laughs> it wasn't. I'm just kidding. All men named Joshua are gaslighters. I'm just kidding. Oh, so any, I don't know his name. <laughs> Literally Deputy Weirdo. Oh, okay. So uh, he oh. knocks on the door. The guy shoots up and the poor guy is so like rattled. He's trying to talk through his window. Sure. He's like, right. and, and, the, he's, and then you can see him. He's struggling to try and he can't even figure out how to roll his window down. So he finally opens the door and he gets out and he's like, hi, yeah, I'm fine. He was not drunk. He, he was, was not, he had no deed. I don't give a shit if his, I don't need to know his marital status uh, I, or who, where his car's registered. I just want to make sure he wasn't dead or didn't yeah. need medical help. Yeah, he wasn't part, part way through an OD exactly, and... or experiencing like a heart issue, or I mean, Jesus right. Christ, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want yeah. to check on somebody whose car is running from then for four, four and a hours. half, a, a half, four and a half hours. Then. Yeah, because that's weird. Thank you. I feel better. It's it's odd. I didn't want to be nosy and... Nelly, but I was like, God damn it. Yeah. I mean, and then you show up, I expected him to be like, you know, yeah, we'll check it. Oh, everything will be fine. But no, he's like, ma'am, ma'am, I can't make it. And I was like, who has called you for a welfare check and been like, well, if he's alive, then get him the well, fuck out of here. That, I mean, that does show you that there are, that he has gotten that call. I guess. Or he's preparing for a like, battle. Probably more than once. And, oh my God. And has actually battled with, you know. <laughs> Santa Clarita. It's Karen's. not illegal to park. I get that. It's not illegal to park right. your car. I, right. He could stay there forever if he wants. It, it's There's no like, please move it on street cleaning day. There's no reason why he could park there. I just, it's weird when someone leaves their car running for four and a half hours. They're slumped in their seat. The, I could hear the air conditioning, but the back window's open. I'm like, mm. this is, there's too many weird things. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, and I don't care if I sound like a, a nosy Nelly. If you park in my neighborhood and leave your car running for four and a half sure. hours, I'll probably try to make sure you're okay. It's, it, it's a weird thing. Hey, are you Thank okay? You. Is absolutely. Thank you. And yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I. All right. I feel better. I would be grateful that See, me somebody too. would call. Me too. Even if, if they woke me out of my nap and I was really tired. Yeah. If I would. Yeah. I was. Because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't getting the best night's sleep. He, no, uh, he, he had an extended cab. I was like, well, if you're going to sleep, why yeah, wouldn't you lay you your would, seat back? You would get down in. The, he was yeah. fully dressed, yeah. uh, not not like in shit clothes. Yeah, dude passed out last night. I mean, he came. He didn't seem. He came home from the bar and he passed out. Maybe, but, which is fine. Like not, or you maybe know, he got thrown out of his house. By his girlfriend. house I don't even care. I just want to make sure there. he was alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's, because it's weird. Okay. Four and a half hours is a weird so thing. So I'm making us new business cards where it just says body finders. Body finders. Yeah. Like. <laughs> just the tipsters. Joshua Bevan, body finder. Body finder. Melissa Morgan, body finder. I'm get, I'm making us new business I, cards. I, I, all right. You have to carry like them with it. you I'm and hand them, them out. I'm hand them out. Put them out on people's um, <laughs> windshields if you think they're dead or like, asleep. Are you, are you Okay. <laughs> Like hey, if you ever need, it. yeah, like a badge. Like I'll knock on the window yeah. myself, and right. they'll wake up. Like oh, you know, and I'll, you... I'll just, I'm just making sure you're okay yeah, here. Here's my, my car. Official, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, so I got sent this hilarious story from my beloved tipster Bridget. Uh, I have a feeling Joshua may have a word or two about this. Before we get into the oh, yes, the sir. story, can we... Can we talk about who's sponsoring this episode? Oh my God. Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, we are being sponsored this week by our friends at Graveline Tours and it's graveline.rip where Joshua and I and Charlotte and Fiona are going next Saturday yes. on Manson's Murderous Spree so excited. Uh, tour. So excited. Thank you so much for reminding me of that. And if you go on to uh, graveline.rip and put in the promo code 
tipster40, you get 40% off. Sweet. Yeah. And I'm excited about a visitor in September who the only thing they want to do is go on one of those tours. So we're going to do that. And then I also wanted to mention our friends, Angie and Jason from Grand Eloquent Word of the Day. Um, You can find it usually, you can even just Google GWTOD. That's kind of their little, you know, because it's such a long, you know, and they have their calendar. They have, uh, I think you have one more week on the Kickstarter campaign uh, till the end of August um, to contribute and you can get the calendar. You can, they have other um, wonderful products in there. Uh, under their wonderful, um, their cottage industry at this point now, they have bookmarks and book plates. And I have a couple pieces of their artwork I'm waiting to get framed. But the even more exciting news than the 2024 calendar is that Jason's first book, the Grand Eloquent Word of the Day book comes out in November of 2023 from Countryman Press. So that's, you know, look for that because I'll be talking about that later. This will be the last week I probably mention the calendar because um, you haven't until the end of August and the way we're going. Yeah, this will go up the last week. So yeah, just the last two weeks we talked about it. So, all right, on to the frivolity. Yeah, please. The murderous frivolity. A blood smudged Florida woman suspected of murder accrued additional charges after she asked police for a, I hate this word, soda, soft drink, and poured it all over herself in an attempt to scrub forensic evidence from her body. (laughs) Daytona Beach police said, Nicole Max, 35, (laughs) was charged with tampering with evidence and resisting arrest with violence and premeditated first-degree murder in the death of 79-year-old Michael Sarah Soley on August 5th per a probable cause affidavit shared with Fox News. Firefighters were called to a smoldering home on the 600 block of Clark Street at 1.46 a.m. on July 1st. Clothes on the second floor had been set on fire. Um, At the time, they said, we have no additional information on the arson investigation. But after extinguishing the flames, First responders found Carasoli lying face down in a blood spattered room. He had suffered blunt force head trauma to the head and stab wounds to the torso. The man's landlord told police that Nicole Max was his other tenant, but she was nowhere to be found. Two cell phones were recovered near the 79 year old's body. One belonged to the victim and the other, which had a bloodied knife balanced on top of it, belonged to Nicole Max. Oh my God. Less than two hours later, police said they spotted a barefoot Max with blood on her leg and ripped shirt outside of a restaurant in the nearby community of Holly Hill. They approached her and she dropped a knife and a hammer at their feet. Oh, wow. Nicole Max evaded questions about her recent whereabouts, where she lived. First, she pointed into a different direction and said, right over there, like by a nearby pawn shop, and then claimed she'd been living on the streets for the last four years. They showed her a photo of Carasoli, and she denied knowing him. When pressed, police said she conceded that she knew a man, but denied knew the man, but denied seeing him on the day he was murdered. Then she shifted again, telling police she currently lived with him and was at their home earlier that day. Daytona police then took Nicole Max into custody for questioning, and they had a probable cause affidavit. After she was read her Miranda rights, Nicole told detectives that she never entered Carasoli's bedroom and only set foot on the second floor of their shared apartment so she could feed her spiders. I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> feed her spiders. When asked about the weapons she dropped, Max became agitated and demanded a lawyer. Police returned later with a warrant to test the woman's bloody body. For evidence. That's when Nicole Max asked for a can of Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> well, of course. It's the and they obliged her. Is that how you stumbled upon this story? Uh-huh. You were looking up Diet no. Mountain Dew? And- <laughs> it was sent to me by Bridget. Okay. She goes, this is has you all over it. <laughs> yes. Mountain Dew and murder. <laughs> Diet Mountain Dew. Uh-huh. And- <laughs> she began to procrastinate with the drink. And when detectives tried to pull it away from her, she poured it all over her body and hair, attempting to interfere with evidence on her body. Oh, man. 
Police allegedly forced a pulling and kicking Max into their cruiser. Blood on the knife found near Carasoli's body matched the samples taken from Max's clothing. Her DNA was reported on the weapon's handle. Uh, A recent study from the North Carolina State University indicated that sucralose, a common artificial sweetener Mm -hmm. known as Splenda, found in Diet Mountain Dew and other sodas, could potentially break down genetic material that makes up DNA. Okay. So it wasn't as silly as I originally thought. Well, I guess they got to her before it got real... diluted so in case you are um held for murder ask for a diet mountain dew diet mountain dew okay i mean it's always been kind of my hero and come to my rescue sure but not for murder just for (laughs) quenching my thirst and right yeah it it helps me to not murder people yes (laughs) yeah that's it that's totally it it's a decision usually a decision between (laughs) Between murder and Mountain and Dew. Like, you know right. what? That's actually, I know you think I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I don't think you're kidding. Okay. Because you know how much, yeah, I mean, like, you know how much I love it. Yeah. So this is a really weird case and Joshua has known about it for a while. Um, he will have forgotten though, because I've only told him three times and that would be like, you know, <laughs> um, and it's been, it's been like on the docket for a while here. And I've looked back and. Uh, it was brought to my attention February 27th of this year. Oh, wow. Okay. So I've been kind of working on it for a couple of months. So a um, alum of Hanover College in Indiana, it's a prestigious small college, about a thousand people total in the entire college. And uh, I guess their big claim to fame right now is that Mike Pence and Woody Harrelson graduated from there. That's a good duo. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Bookends? Yeah. Yeah. So this um, person, we're going to call him Dr. K. Okay. Uh, Dr. K uh, found the podcast through some friends, said, I love the podcast. I listen to it all the time. And there's been something that's bothered me for a long time. When I was a student at Hanover, uh, a security guard was murdered, and I feel like it was covered up. Oh, no. So Dr. K couldn't be more right, and it's more weird then I can tell you. Okay. So you get, yeah, okay. So I have some updates here yeah. and we will probably be talking about this case at another time, but the next probably three or four weeks, what I'm going to be asking of, of the tipsters is to really search your soul and call law enforcement. We have three or four cases coming up that require help. Oh, okay. And I know, I'm going to start crying. I know how amazing the tipsters have been, and I'm going to ask for your help, Um, especially the tipsters around where I grew up. Uh, This case is Indiana. There will be a case coming up in Ohio. There will be a case coming up in Kentucky, and there will be a case coming up in North Carolina. I I didn't live there, but I lived, you know, in those areas. And these are cases that people are still alive. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Persons of interest. Um, and I don't know if anyone in within the sound of my voice will hear this, but if you hear this and you think you might know someone who might know something or might know someone who might know someone, I'm just going to ask for your help because these cases, this one especially, this, uh, this person doesn't have an advocate for him. And... Mm-hmm what happened to him in a time that was probably difficult uh, for him to be who he was, he really needs our help. So May 5th of 1984, Herschel Chandler, 58 year old night security guard. And I'm going to say the word, apparently I have it underlined and in bold and in italics because I, the more I find out about this case, the less I'm, I'm convinced, but he was, apparently beaten to death with the receiver of a desk phone while interrupting a robbery of a safe in a back room of the business office in the administration building on Hanover's campus. I'm saying apparently because I took it as gospel at first because I'm very naive. And the more I think about it, if you're going to heist a safe, would you break in with no tools? With nothing. No. Hmm, okay. If you were surprised by a security guard, 
would you grab a phone and beat them so badly that they were found a few hours later in a pool of their own blood unrecognizable? Jeez. That seems more personal to me. Yeah. So while I took everything at first as, oh my God, it was just an interrupted robbery and this is so terrible and this man has no one to advocate for him and it's still unsolved and oh my God. Yeah, um, other things have come up and I'm, I don't buy any of this bullshit anymore. So they believe he was murdered around 4.30 a.m. and he was discovered at 7.24 a.m. by a member of the janitorial staff. Hmm. Yeah, so Herschel Chandler is an unarmed, you know, night security guard okay. at a small private college. Yeah. Night watch, not not a lot of crime happening, just making sure there's right. no... Like people fucking people, in a bush or something, yeah, maybe? Yeah, or, you know... Drunken, disorderly yeah. kids. Right. Somebody defacing property or something, chasing them off. Yeah. Right. It, that's a great point, Joshua. Herschel's murder was the first homicide on the Hanover campus in its entire history. Yeah, okay. It, it had been around at that point 157 years. So it's now been around like 192 or something, a long time. Okay. That was like 39 years ago. I'm bad at math. So the safe held financial records, insurance policies, keys to buildings and cars, and a small amount of change because the bank deposit had been made the day before. Hmm, okay. If you're going to heist a safe. <laughs> you want it to actually have valuables in it? Right. Yeah. You might check and see when yeah. do they make deposits. Sure. Let's say it's an inside job. Yeah. Let's say it's someone who maybe works in the, you know, staff or a student who's an intern or something. Wouldn't yeah. you make sure? Yeah, that it's that it's got something in there worth stealing. Right. Yeah. And if you're gonna heist a safe, would you show up with something to maybe help you heist a safe? Yeah. And not beat it with a phone? Did you think you're gonna use the desk phone <laughs> to get into the safe? Yeah. 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 I'm a little I I'm just not buying it. So Herschel Chandler, there are there are some indications he struggled with his assailant. The room was in disarray and a combination dial on the safe had been knocked off, but the safe had not been opened to me. Hmm. Thank you. I love that face. I appreciate yeah. that face. That could have happened in a struggle. Yeah. The dial on the front knocked yeah. off papers, everything scattered. Sure. Would that happen if you were trying to heist a safe no. and someone interrupted you? No. You would is get that, rid of the threat. Is that your is that your the way that you were gonna break in was just bash the dial? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you I, it's like I don't have anything, but if I can use this awesome phone receiver. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, mm. huh? Yeah. None of this makes any sense yeah. to me. So I, of course, am like I can't find shit about this guy. I found a couple of articles from 94, one from the Indianapolis Star, and one from the Seymour, Indiana Tribune. And I mean, I just want to show Joshua. Here's the entire thing. Oh, that's the whole story. Yep. Those three sentences. There. Yep. Yeah, okay. That's the first one. There's the second. Oh, well, that one. Yeah, that's it. That one's that one's a whole uh, lot more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's no. it. Literally, that's it. <sighs> so I ask the brilliant Suzanne, who is um, a monster at research. Hey, help me find something about this. Sure. So she has access to things I don't. I probably could, but maybe I'm too lazy or I don't want to pay for them. And so she's like, you know, I don't find any record of a wedding or kids um, no marriage certificate or kids. His parents are deceased. Uh, I believe he had a sibling, maybe a brother, and he's deceased. So Herschel's on his own. Okay. And he, how old is he? 58. 58. Okay. So 1984, central Indiana, extremely yes. not yes. welcoming to any other kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. Suzanne said, I said, well, Maybe he was gay. And she said, I think the term back then would be a confirmed bachelor. Confirmed bachelor. And I was yeah. like, I think you're right, madam. Yeah. So I start with the college. I can't find fucking shit about this poor man's 
life or death or anything, no updates, no nothing. So I call the college. I happened upon a terrific security guard. I asked for the security office Mm -hmm. and he said, oh, I was a a patrolman at the time that that happened. I wasn't here then, but I believe this case is- uh, Oh, he's a retired cop? That, yes, that became a security guard. Security. Yes. And he actually was, wow. Yeah, okay. he said, I was a young patrolman when that happened. And I believe this case, the lead on this case is ISP, which is Indiana State Police. Okay. And I'm like, terrific. You've been a big help. I um, There had been some changes in jurisdictions in, in 39 years. So I had to figure out which jurisdiction had Herschel's case. Okay. I found out, and it's Jefferson County. Okay. And I call Jefferson County and I, you know, ask for a detective who might be, you know, in charge of Herschel's case and I leave a message and I get nothing. So after I get nothing, I think I know one detective with the Indiana State Police okay. and this is my opportunity to ask for his help. Sure. So what's funny is. I call him and he's with a different jurisdiction, but I thought, you know what? Maybe he knows the brethren. Maybe I call him and he picks up the phone and I was like, and I had interviewed him in 2020 and he was not my biggest fan. And he was a younger detective and with his um, partner who was a a veteran who has since retired and is now a sheriff of a different County. But I was like, this isn't going to go well. And I'm like, hi detective. I don't know if you remember me. I interviewed you in 2020. And what that really meant is I interviewed his partner and he sat there and it was on speakerphone and he said nothing. And his partner said, isn't that right? And he'd be like, "Mm -hmm." like that was it. He, nothing. He immediately broke into an apology and said, of course I remember you. I'd only had a few years on as a detective. I now have five years. I didn't understand the process. I didn't trust you. I didn't know what you wanted. I didn't want to participate in this. My partner made me. I get it now. You weren't trying to come after me or us or anything. And I was like, no, I wanted to help solve a case. He goes, I get it now. I get it. He's like, of course, I I remember you and I and I want to apologize for my behavior. And I was like, wow. who are you, sir? Can I record How this? Cool. Yeah. And he goes, are you calling about... Blank, blank, a a different person's name who we'll be covering. Oh, a a whole different Yes. Okay. And I go, no, who's that? And he goes, oh, darn, I thought you were calling about that. He said, I was actually going to see if you wanted to cover that case. And I was like, yes, Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. But can we talk (laughs) about this one? So I tell him and he goes, oh, my gosh, I remember that. I was a motorcycle cop at the time. Oh, wow. He goes, I vaguely remember that. Whatever happened? And I said, nothing. Hmm. And he's like, what do you mean? I tell him what I found, which is nothing. I can't get anyone to call me back. And he's like, let me see what I can find for you. Cool. Okay. A couple of weeks later, he calls me and I can hear the tone in his voice. Those Midwestern guys don't have a whole lot of filter. (laughs) You know, that's maybe that's why I am how I am. Sure. He goes, yeah. And I go, what? And he goes, I've never been treated this badly. And I go, what do you mean? Oh, by other cops. Oh, yeah, not, oh. He said, I called the other jurisdiction, Jefferson County, and said, hey, I'm calling about Herschel Chandler's case. And it was basically, nope. I wouldn't give him anything. No. Uh, and oh. he said, what do you mean, nope? And he goes, we're not talking about it. Wow. And he said, can I get a file or are there, are there any persons of interest? Uh, yeah, we know who did it. He's incarcerated in another state for murder. And he said, oh, what's his name? Nope. Whoa. What state's he in? Nope. Wow. He said he tried to find out surreptitiously who it was, but he couldn't find out. Huh. So that's April. We're now six weeks in. So was there a reason behind or were they just He doesn't dicks? know. Huh. He doesn't. He said these are obviously the people that uh, inherited the case. They're not- Sure. It's, you know, they're too young to have, but they're getting word from somewhere. This is a big nope. So he says to me, I will be in person with them in a function in June. And I'm going to hope maybe talking in person, they'll treat me differently. He said, I've never, he said they were Kurt, one person. He said he was Kurt with me and then basically hung up. Wow. Okay. So June, big function. Everybody's together. 
in a casual way. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. All right. He said he corners this detective and his boss. Okay. A sergeant and says, hey, how about the Herschel Chandler case? And they both went, nope. <gasps> wow. Now here's the part that warms my soul. This detective said, look, a podcast wants to cover it. W right. Why won't you talk to them? Nope, we want nothing to do with that. Hmm. And he says, all right, look, I'm just gonna tell you, she's gonna cover it whether you want her to or not. You may as well just do it. Nice. Nope. Wow. So you're back in half. Uh-huh. Wow. So he yeah, went from not liking not, me yeah. or trusting me to now being so I'm a I'm a resource for him and I'm he's a resource for me. Yeah. Way cool. So when we spoke, uh, he goes, that's what happened. And I go, that's really fucked up. And he said, yes, it is. And he said, what if you try the Jefferson County DA's office? And I said, I'm going to, I'll, I'll try any place. Uh, sure. And I said, I want you to know I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this episode. And he right. goes, go with God. Okay. And I said, yeah, I'm going to let my rage fuel me. Yeah. And he goes, good. Yeah. So we'll be talking with him later about another case, a missing person. Sweet. But in the meantime, I started with the Jefferson County DA's office. I spoke to two people. They promised to call me back. They never did. Hmm. I was so upset about finding so fuck little about Herschel. I went to, you know, Dr. Google and um, found something that I thought was interesting, but I wasn't sure it was him. It's an unusual name. And this is about maybe an hour away from where he lived and died at Hanover College. So I find July of 1977. Now take into consideration, he'd worked at Hanover for the, the president of the university. wasn't quite sure. He said around six years. So that yeah. means he would have started in 78. All right. So let's say he started between 78 and 79 and worked until 84 when he was murdered. Okay. So this is from 1977. Introducing Herschel Chandler. We're proud to have Herschel Chandler as a valued member of our interior design staff. He is exceptionally qualified by experience to assist you in planning and furnishing a corner, a room, or your entire home. Oh, okay. Noblesville Furniture Company on Logan Street in Noblesville, Indiana. Noblesville Furniture Company is one of the most complete design centers in the state, filled with hundreds of exceptional idea-provoking displays of furniture, carpeting, draperies, wall cover, antique chandeliers, and accessories. Our home furnishings are shown in many price ranges. A visit to Noblesville Furniture Company will be a most pleasing adventure. So I see the address. Okay. 926 Logan Street. So I do a Google search and there's um, a art gallery in that address. Oh, now there's yeah. an art gallery. Okay. Well, it's sort of. Uh, it says the owner has been in the business for 36 years. It's a woman. I call and they have recently moved. Oh. Recently moved to uh, Carmel, Indiana, which is a snotty upscale area. Okay. I had a friend who owned a house there, a big Victorian. So this woman owns this interior design art gallery place. Okay. And I was like, hey, do you remember Noblesville Furniture? She said, of course I did. It was right next. We shared a space. Oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. And I said, when did you open your art gallery? And it was a few years after, Okay. you know, Herschel. Well, a few years after Herschel died. Um, it was like probably 10 years after Herschel worked there. Okay. I'm going to guess he worked there 77 to 78. Okay. Like maybe a year. Okay. Work a year and a half most and then went to there, Hanover yeah, College. Moved mm -hmm. Yeah. Moves an hour away and becomes a nighttime security guard. Sure. Right. Yeah. A little, a little, uh, a little more under the cover, under the radar. Yes. Yeah. See how smart you are? No. Yeah. So it's an unusual name. I'm not sure it's him. I text Dr. Dr. K and say, hey, do any of your fraternity brothers, could you, you know, do they remember what Herschel looked like? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure it's the right guy, right? He's a handsome dude. Mm -hmm. He looked, uh, for the mid 70s, he was a dashing, probably gay guy. So I have these texts. 
one of the frat brothers said, I had a brief encounter with Mr. Chandler during a walk of shame back from a sorority house. <laughs> yep. That, that seems like the yes, time where at you at night, were, running into the oh, night guard. The, yeah. <laughs> he mentioned he was retired from the old Bacon's Department Store in St. Matthews, Indiana, as an interior decorator. Uh, okay. So the store is now owned by Dillard's, and he would have retired sometime in the mid-70s. Okay. So that makes sense, so right? That was his. Yeah, he he retired from Dillard's, went to the the uh, the other spot, and, mm -hmm. yeah. Noblesville Furniture, Nobles, and you. then becomes security guard. Yeah. So I say, do any of your um, frat brothers remember anything about him? Were there any rumors? And I get this back. None of the brothers have heard any rumors about Herschel, but one said he remembered a person of interest that was fastidious about his appearance. Now, I'm not saying his name. They gave me his name. I have looked him up. He's still alive. He would have been a young student at the time. Okay, so this was a student that was that was interested in his own appearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything, right? They're all in a frat. Maybe they're all like you know rich or have sure. scholarships or well dressed because you're in a frat. But let's just say on the street, like I my one of my closest friends, Todd. He and his husband Chris. He's like we're really bad gays. We have Buddha bellies and we wear right. shitty shirts. <laughs> I was gonna say if someone saw you on the street, they wouldn't be like, oh that guy's so gay. Right. <laughs> They'd be like, that's like a, a surfer kid. Right. Yeah, right. It's very it's very rare that I get mistaken. <laughs> right. You'd be a bad gay. <laughs> be a bad You'd be a real real <laughs> bad gay. Bad, yeah. So I don't think Herschel would be a he looks like he would might yeah, you looks, might be like, looks, hey, he looks, you he know, looks well dressed. Yeah. Right. So this person, they gave me his name. He is now, you know, uh, a, a little older than me, would have been a student at the time. He is an enigma. Mm. Uh, his social media lists him as uh, so many things. Uh, actor, producer, director, fundraiser, millionaire, lives in Southern California, also lives in Texas. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to show you a picture later. I can't obviously post it with this because I'm not saying his okay. name. And it's the craziest picture I've ever seen. It's two, it's two people's pictures. Hmm. I don't know if one of them is older and one is younger and they put it together, but one is more dark. One is more light. It's the same. It, it, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. It looks like it's straight out of central casting. Hmm. He is a, a very handsome older man. Okay. You know, like in his 60s. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Right. So just because there's rumors about him doesn't mean jack shit, right? Sure. No, yeah, absolutely. Right. I think it's interesting that the frat brothers were like, oh, yeah, no, I didn't think anything about Mr. Chandler, but this guy who okay. was rumored to have been involved. Okay. he He's rumored to be involved in the murder or just yep. rumored to have a relationship with in In the murder. Okay. Okay. Now- you know, could it just be wildfire spreading around a sure. small campus? Yeah. Right. It's, yeah, exactly. It's just fascinating. Okay. So I find him. I email him. I call and leave a message. I don't hear back. Okay. I have a list of all the people I've called about this case. It's, it's, it's growing. Mm -hmm. It's a very... Weird list, especially considering how the detective in the other jurisdiction was treated by. Yeah, wow. So I called uh, the Jefferson County DA. I called the suspected person and, or a, let's call him a per person of interest. I don't want to say sure. suspect. And I was like, hi, I host a podcast and um, you were a member of a fraternity and some people, I'm talking to some people in the fraternity about an unsolved homicide from 1984. I was just calling to see if you had any recollection of it. Mm, wow. You know, just trying to like right. yeah. make it more chummy. Yeah. 
Uh, ironically, another alum and person in this fraternity is the present governor of Indiana, Eric Holcomb. Oh. Now, he was a few years younger, so he wasn't there when Herschel was murdered, but he is still, you know, a Hanover alum and was in this specific fraternity. Okay. So I call the governor. Okay. And I email the governor. Okay. And I say, I host a podcast and uh, some of your frat brothers suggested I start, I start with you. It's Mm -hmm. not, I'm not starting with him. I've done a lot already, but I'm still, you know, so I got nothing. Hmm. I snoop around and I find his general counsel. That man's uh, name is Michael Nossett. And I'm going to give his number at the end of this. This is this is Herschel Chandler's. No, this no. is the governor's. The governor's general counsel. Uh-huh. Got it. And I'm gonna say, uh, I did say, hey, uh, I was wondering if you could help me. I've, I, I get it. The governor's busy. I've left emails. You know, he puts himself out there as this guy. You can, you know, reach out to me. I've uh, right. I want to tell you the people I've attempted. Uh, Jefferson County, um, Indiana State Police jurisdiction, post whatever. Jefferson County DA, you, uh, you know, I'm like trying, I'm trying to find anyone who can help me. So my next step is going to be the state attorney general. Yeah. I don't know that they want to hear that. I don't. I that's why I'm going to do that. That's yeah. I mean, right. Somebody's got to start fucking talking. Yeah. Or, or tell me why you're not talking. That's the part that I'm, that I'm sitting here. Wait, okay. Why? So. Here's here's a theory. This com- this college has a lot of endowments and funding. Mm, okay. uh, the person of interest apparently came from maybe a family that was well connected. Okay. Uh, at the time, the regime of Hanover. I don't have any basis for this, but so many people have said I wouldn't put anything past him sweeping something like this under the rug. And I'm like, I wonder why though, maybe the person of interests, father, family contributed a lot of money. Okay. These are suppositions. This is, I have no proof of this. Right. Just letting you know that if I am treated, if, if a detective is treated badly and shut the fuck down, what do you think my chances are? Yeah. Yeah. Which is why he was like, go with God, go, right, do cool. go cover it. He said, I told, he said, this is the sweetest thing. He goes, you don't know this woman. I do. She's going to cover this case, whether you want to come on or not. I suggest you just go just on. Go. Yeah. Even if he, even if they came on and said, uh, I don't have that information. Nope. Just something. Well, even if they said, Hey, here's the, the legitimate reason why we can't right. talk about this. Except there's because, none. Well, I mean, I could understand if, if somehow putting certain information public would, would mess up their ability to create the case. And you would respect that. I know you would. I you absolutely would. would. give them the time to, to make it Of happen. course. But yeah, this feels, this feels like sweeping under the rug. I, I just don't. The, when, the Jefferson County detective said, oh, oh, we know who did it. Uh, he's incarcerated in another state on murder. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, well, if you if you know who did it, then are you yeah. going to go talk to him? Well, I mean, we think we know who did it. Mm. Yeah. I've never experienced anything quite like this. Yeah, I've had things like kept for me and and like you just explained, understood. Yeah. Things, not everything can be put out there. A a 39-year-old unsolved homicide of a man who has no one to advocate for him because he was probably alone and gay who's murdered, whether it was because he knew someone or whether he truly interrupted a a botched safe heist, which just never added up to me. This is this is a complete this is just complete bullshit to me. And the number of people I've reached out to who won't even call me back is startling. Yeah. Even to call me back to tell me I can't talk to you. Sure. Just acknowledge anything. Right. And the only person who who cares and is really trying is a guy who is in a different jurisdiction and is was trying to pull all the strings he could 
to get more information and he is shut the fuck down. Yeah. That's that's nuts. Yeah. There's there's something way deeper here that So a frat boy who remembers a discussion with a security guard as he's doing the walk of shame from, you know, um laying pipe for with a sorority sister. He he must have been a good guy. You know? Sure. He's worked there for 5 or 6 years. I don't think it was the career of his choice. I think it was a retirement gig. Yeah. And maybe, you know, like, like I think your theory is kind of beautiful, Joshua, that maybe he flew more under the radar at night. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because honestly, the frat guys are like, oh, no, we didn't think about him being gay. But let me tell you, we thought this other guy right. who was rumored to may have been involved might have been. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, like you said, 1984, the climate. In Indiana? In Indiana. For, in 2023, well, Joshua, sure. the climate in Indiana. You're not going to be right. welcomed. So, yeah, you you love interior design and right. and that's this, you know, whole fabulous career that you have. And like, and you're great you, at it. And, and you do then, it for 20 something years and you retire. And you're like, OK, I'm done with this. I'm mm-hmm. going to go. Uh, I'm going to go just chill and just live. Right. And, yeah, do something silly like stop. You know, shine flashlights at at uh, right at kids, kids in, <laughs> drunken in kids, and yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like yeah, exactly. Yeah, it just breaks my heart that he died alone, and I no family. I don't know who would have been an advocate for him if he had friends or yeah. you know exes or it was in a relationship. It just feels like his life after 58 years of being a good person didn't matter anymore. And I don't want him to think it doesn't matter. I hope he knows that people care and that, you know, even people that don't know him think that it's ridiculous that nobody will even talk about it. Like, any little piece of information, if you're you're not going to talk to me, uh, okay, I get it, you don't have to, but if you're not going to talk to a detective who is, you know, also a really good guy who wants to do a good job and can't right. violate whatever weird things you've set up. I, I don't, I don't understand that. Yeah. So instead of giving you a number for a police department, because I don't trust them anymore, I'm giving you the number for Governor Holcomb's general counsel. General Counsel Michael Nossett. He is listed as a contact for several things involving the governor. And I don't know where else to go except the state attorney general, which would be my next step. But because we've been talking about this case since February, I didn't want to wait any longer to get it out. Hmm. So I imagine we'll have um, an update at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know we're going to have an update soon on Jenny Isle's case because of information that came in after the episode. So Hmm. I would really like, let's just say we'll never find out for sure what happened or who did this. I would like somebody to try. Yeah, (laughs) People are still alive. Yeah. And I don't know how long that will go on. You know, this case is 39 years old. But there are definitely people alive that you could talk to. Right. And if they aren't involved, they aren't involved. But somebody who knows what they're doing and how to do this needs to fucking give a shit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, have been more angry in the last three or four months than I've been in a while and I would put it on a back burner and then I would get to talk to the detective and he would be like, I got nothing. And I'm like, you got nothing. If you got nothing, I got less than nothing. Right. So here's what I'm going to ask you. And I'm going to be asking a lot from the tipsters in the next few weeks. I'm really going to be asking a lot and I know who you are and I know how amazing you have been in the past. And I'm going to ask you to be amazing again. If you know anything about the May 5th, 1984 murder of Herschel Chandler at Hanover College in Indiana, or anyone who may have been involved, if you went to school there, if you if you know anything, I don't care if it's a rumor, call the general counsel for Governor Eric Holcomb, Michael Nossett, N-O-S-S-E-T-T. 
His phone number is 317-232-4567. Now his email address is weird and I um, checked it and checked it, but it did finally go through. It's it's odd, but it's M as in Mary, N as in Nancy, O as in opera, S as in Sam, S as in Sam, E as in elephant, T as in Tom, T as in Tom, at gov.in.gov. I've never heard of that hmm. kind of an email address before. Yeah, well. Most um, government or even law enforcement, it'll be like whatever, whatever, gov right. dot gov but this is gov dot in dot gov was that for the governor's office mm-hmm, maybe governor oh of at yeah got the first gov is governor and, and then the second one's government, government. Yeah. yeah maybe that's it right. but it did go through okay. i've emailed them several times and i've left messages several times and i don't know if it's a numbers game if a bunch of us keep trying but i'm going to ask mm. if you know anything start there if you don't want to start there please call us and I will find someone somehow somewhere to get the information to somebody who cares. You can call us at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. You can email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can find us on any of the social media platforms, just the Tipsters Facebook page, JT Tipsters at Instagram, JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter, and more cowbell. If you would like to support this podcast and get early access and other cool murderous swag, go to patreon.com slash just the tipsters. Mm-hmm.